<laughs> Hi, friends. I'm your old pal, Papa Dale. I'm a retired pastor, teacher, theologian, and professor with over 50 years of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Dale Warren, but professionally I'm known in my writing, teaching, and lectures as D.A. Warren. But my friends all just call me Papa Dale, so please, you can call me Papa Dale. You can see the details of my testimony, family life, education, and ministry experience in other videos on this playlist. So for now, let's get right into the topic for today. And what is the topic of today? The topic for today is Two Kings. This is the JHI, the Jan Hess Institute, BA, Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature lecture on the analytic, the literary analytic of two kings. And so let's go. The Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature degree is challenging. It attempts to develop in the student's mind recognition of the difference between a literal meaning or a literary one. Students need to know these Hebrew idioms, literature types, and literary devices so well that they can be recognized as they read and study scripture. The difference in application can be profound. How many misinformed zealots in history have actually cut off their hand as Jesus spoke of doing in Matthew 5.30? Tragically, they didn't recognize the literary device of hyperbole. Now, the book of two kings continues the narrative from one kings, documenting the history of the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The book covers the decline and fall of both kingdoms due to their persistent disobedience to God. The book is a poignant reminder of the consequences of turning away from divine commandments and emphasizing the need for faithful adherence to God's will. Through the stories of various kings, prophets, and significant events, Two Kings offers profound lessons on leadership, faithfulness, and divine justice. So the first broad category of literature analysis is the Hebrew idiom found in Two Kings. Hebrew idioms add depth and cultural context to the text of Two Kings. Here are some of the idioms found in the book, and we have six. The first is to stand before the Lord. This you can see in 2 Kings 3, verse 14. This phrase means to serve or minister in God's presence. Hebrew idiom number two, to gird one's loins. See 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. This idiom signifies preparing oneself for action or a journey. Hebrew idiom number three, to make one's face shine. See 2 Kings 3 verse 15. This means to show favor or approval. Then you have uh, Hebrews idiom number four, to lift up one's eyes. See 2 Kings 6 verse 17. This Hebrew idiom indicates looking or seeing often with a deeper or spiritual insight. And then Hebrew idiom number five, to pour out one's heart, 2 Kings 20 verse 5. This means to express one's deepest feelings or prayers. And Hebrew idiom number six, to strike hands. And 2 Kings chapter 10 verse 15 is the example for this. This signifies making an agreement or a pledge. Well, these Hebrew idioms enrich the narrative by providing cultural and historical layers of meaning, enhancing the reader's understanding of the text. And now the second broad category of literary analysis that we discuss is the category of literature types. Literature types help us identify different types of literature and their function within the biblical text. In Two Kings, these points highlight the complexity and diversity of the narratives and messages conveyed. And we have five. The literature type of narrative literature. Two Kings, 
primarily consists of narrative accounts detailing the various reigns of kings and their actions. See 2 Kings chapter 1 verse 1 through chapter 25 verse 30. Then there is the literature type of the prophetic literature. The book features prominent prophets like Elisha and Isaiah, whose messages and miracles are central to the narrative. See 2 Kings 2 verses 1 through chapter 13 verse 25. Then there is the literature type of wisdom literature. The actions and decisions of the kings often reflect themes of wisdom and folly, highlighting the consequences of wise or foolish leadership. See 2 Kings 18, verse 1 through chapter 20, verse 21. And then there is literature type number four, the covenant literature. The narrative repeatedly references the covenant between God and Israel, underscoring the blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. See 2 Kings 23, verses 1 through 27. And our last literature type is type 5, the miracle literature. Now here we have numerous miracles performed by prophets, such as Elisha's miracles, demonstrating God's power and intervention. See 2 Kings 4, 1 through 44. These literature types reveal the rich tapestry of two kings, showcasing its narrative depth, prophetic messages, wisdom teachings, and covenant emphasis, and the miraculous events. Together they illustrate the overarching themes of divine justice and faithfulness. And the last broad category of literary analysis that we're discussing today is the category of the literary device. Literary devices in Two Kings enhance the narrative and bring out the underlying themes and messages. Recognizing these literary devices helps in appreciating the text's literary artistry. And the literary device number one of six is the prose. The book primarily uses straightforward prose to narrate the historical events and actions of the kings. See 2 Kings chapter 1 verse 1 through chapter 25 verse 30. And then there is the literary device of hyperbole. And this is an exaggeration used for emphasis, such as in descriptions of the wealth and power of the kings. See 2 Kings 18, verses 28 through 35. Then there is the literary device of the metaphor. Metaphorical language such as referring to Israel as a stiff-necked people enriches the text. See 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 14. Then there is number four literary device, synonymous parallelism. Repetition of the same idea in different words is seen in prayers and prophecies. See 2 Kings 19, 15 through 19. Then we have literary device number five, which is antithetical parallelism. Contrasting ideas are used to highlight differences, such as the contrast between faithful and unfaithful kings. See 2 Kings 21 verses 1 through 16. And last but not least, we have the literary device of imagery and vivid descriptions like the chariots of fire seen by Elisha's servant uh, create by Elijah's servant Elisha create powerful visual pictures. See 2 Kings 6 through 14. And again I say, just because uh, there is a literary device used here in conjunction with this miracle, uh, doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It did happen, it's just described with great imagery. And so these literary devices enhance the text of 2 Kings by adding depth and clarity to the narrative. They help convey the book's messages more effectively, making the historical and spiritual lessons more impactful for the reader. 
And so in conclusion, Two Kings offers a compelling continuation of the history of Israel and Judah, emphasizing the consequences of disobedience and the importance of faithful leadership. Through its detailed narrative, prophetic messages, and rich use of literary devices, the book provides profound lessons for today's believers. And by understanding the Hebrew idioms, the literature types, and the literary devices, we can gain a deeper insight into the text's meaning and relevance for our lives today. Now, this has been your old pal, Papa Dale. The year is 2024. I've been your host for this lecture on Two Kings. I will remind you once again that if you're studying for the BA, the Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Literature degree, it is a requirement to read all of the lecture notes, both for the main lecture on the book and uh, the lecture notes on this literary analysis lecture. Also, you require, oh, by the way, you can watch those lectures or see those notes in the uh, video transcript or uh, they'll be posted in the video notes section or below everything down in the comment section. It's also a requirement that you look at and read each Bible citation in both lectures. And now if the Bible citation is for multiple chapters, you don't need to reread multiple chapters. But if it's for one chapter or less, then you need to reread that. Okay, and so now, the Lord willing, I shall return and bring to you a, another lecture. Uh, and until that time, this has been your old pal, Papa Dale. And I'm signing off, but I'm saying I will be praying for you. And specifically, I'll be praying that you will be well and that you will be blessed. No. <laughs> ah, there's my dog bandit and saying he's saying you're going to be well and be blessed. Burr, burr. <laughs>